Well, if you have your Bibles, are you ready to get a little word in you this morning? I'm ready to share a good word with you. Philippians chapter one, if you will. We're going to be in our second week in this series called Contagious Joy. Uh, we're looking at the book or the letter of Philippians. It was written by the Apostle Paul while he was in prison, prison to a group of people who, for the most part, were impoverished. Now, usually you do not think of prison and impoverishment in context of joy. But this is truly a letter of joy. 19 times the Apostle Paul mentions joy in the four chapters that we have here. Today I want to talk to you about how you and I can experience joy in our prayer life as we pray one for another. Philippians chapter number one, and we're going to look at three passages of scripture this morning. I encourage you to keep your Bibles open. We begin with verse number nine. This is Paul's prayer to the church at Philippi. And it matters to us today. He writes and he says, This I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and in all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere without offense to the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Christ Jesus, to the glory and the praise of of God. May the Lord add his blessing to the public reading of the scripture this morning. First of all, let me ask you a question. Is anyone here willing to admit that you're a country music fan? A few of you. Yeah, I, I enjoy country music and I heard this song not long ago and I thought about it when I was writing this message. It's called simply, I pray for you. And this young country artist no doubt was going through a difficult season in his life and relationships Kind of how it works in country music, right? And so he goes to church and he has this encounter with God and he writes about it. He says, I haven't been to church since I don't remember when. Things were going great till they fell apart again. So I listened to the preacher as he told me what to do. He said, you can't go hating others who have done wrong to you. Sometimes we get angry, but we must not condemn let the good Lord do his job. You just pray for them. Seems like he's getting it. Then he goes to the course. So I pray your brakes go out running down a hill. I pray a flower pot falls from the windowsill and hits you in the head. I pray your birthday comes and nobody calls. I pray you're flying high when your engine stalls. I pray all your dreams never come true. Just know, wherever you are, honey, I'm praying for you. <laughs> I don't know that's exactly what the minister was trying to convey in a sermon that morning. I'm certain that is not what the gospel teaches us as to how we are to pray for one another. But I also know each of us at one point or another have felt like praying something like that concerning someone in our life. It is my goal this morning to help raise the standard of our prayer. It is my goal to help us see that prayer is something much more than just Christian responsibility, but it is a place by which you and I can delight and find joy in. When we think of the Apostle Paul, we oftentimes think about his teachings or his preachings or certainly his writings, but often we forget that Paul was a great man of prayer. In every letter he wrote, he speaks to them about the prayers he is praying for them, to the Romans, to the Corinthians, to the Ephesians, the Galatians, those in Philippi and those in Thessalonica. He says to them, I am praying for you and this is what I'm praying for you. Now, many of us, when we think about prayer, we do think of it as a duty and there is a duty as believers to be responsible to pray. But I pray that we move beyond the duty of prayer and simply the responsibility that we can experience the joy of prayer as Paul did. Notice there in your Bible in verse number three of chapter one, the apostle Paul says, I thank God upon every remembrance of you. He says, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you with all joy. There it is. Paul says, when I pray, it's not just simply out of duty. It is out of thanksgiving and it is out of joy. I want you to notice here that Paul's prayer probably looks a lot different than many of our prayers. 
Maybe it's just me, but maybe you could agree with this, that so many of my prayers and maybe yours focus about me, focus about what's going on in my life, my frustrations or hardships or uncertainties or decisions I'm making. And what we discover, part of the reason Paul has such joy is he's not just focused on him, but he's praying for others. But it's not just the fact that he's praying. He has this deep abiding conviction of the Holy Spirit that we serve a God that when we call upon his name, he hears us and he moves. That is not just ritual. It's not just religious activity, but that we are engaged in this conversation with the living God who says, come and pray and I will answer you. And Paul says, I want you to see how I'm praying for you to the believers at Philippi. Now, let me say this. This is important for you to know that Paul was not simply just giving us his prayer so that he lets us, gives us insight to his prayer life. This is a model prayer that you and I should pray for one another. And there are five things he prays in this prayer. Five words I want to lift up to you this morning in our time together. And the first one, he prays for love. Secondly, he prays for excellence. Thirdly, he prays for integrity. Fourth, he prays for fruit. And then finally, he prays for glory. So I want to look at all five of those very quickly with you this morning. And I pray that it would inspire you and inspire us as a community of faith, both here on campus and those watching online. It would inspire us to be people of prayer, not simply for ourselves, but we would pray one for another with great joy. Are you excited about what God may be speaking to us in this moment? I know I am. Let's look at the first one. The first thing he prays is he prays for love. This is an essential of the spiritual growth that God wants to take place in our life. Notice if you will, Philippians chapter nine, verse or uh, chapter one, verse number nine. And he says, and this is what I'm praying for you, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and in discernment. Everything in our Christian experience, friends, must be built on the foundation of love. Love is the highest virtue that we can experience in the Christian life. It is really the distinctive of our faith. Even non-believers are familiar with the hallmark of the Bible, which is John 3, 16, right? Say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's the gospel. That God sent his son to us because he loved us and wanted us to experience his love. In Romans chapter five, Paul writes and he says, now God has demonstrated his love for us, that while we were still lost in our sins, Christ died for us. And he says in verse 5 of that same chapter of Romans, that now for the believers, for those who have trusted in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that God has poured out and spread into our heart the love of God by the Holy Spirit. That we have been recipients of this love. We are a part of the epic divine love story of God. God loved us. We in return love God. And then we love one another and we are loved by one another. And that is the distinctive of the Christian experience is that there is a divine love that is working in and among us. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He says, this is how critical love is. If you don't have love, nothing else matters. He says, listen, if I could speak with the tongues of men and angels, but I have not love, I'm nothing more than a clanging symbol. He says, if I have faith by which I can move all mountains, it doesn't matter. He says, if I can prophesy the future without love, it won't matter. He says, even if I give my body to be burned, even if I live my life in that type of sacrifice, if it is not founded and rooted in flowing out of the love of God, then my life is nothing. This is the distinctive of the Christian faith. 
And Paul is praying for this group of believers in Philippi. He's praying for us and we should pray it for one another that this love that we have experienced in our life would not be capped, but it would, it would abound more and more. It would gush out. Several years ago, my family and I, we went out to Yellowstone National Park and wow, what an experience that was. And one of my most exciting moments of that trip was we went to see Old Faithful. Old Faithful is a geyser that goes off about every 22 minutes, I believe. And I'm telling you, when it goes off, there is no missing it. It roars. It throws mist and steam all up in the air. And there are thousands of people that come from all over around the world to watch it go off. And that's what this image is that Paul is giving us. We ought to pray that our life is like a geyser of the love of God that goes off consistently and faithfully as we live in and move in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that we should be identified as a community of love, those that love God and love one another. That's really the mark of the Christian faith. It's not that we showed up here on Sunday morning. It's not that we brought our Bibles either in book form or on tablet form. It's not that we know how to say amen at all the right times in a sermon, but go ahead and do that if you know when to do that. It's not that we had the right bumper stickers on our car. It's the fact that we love God and we love one another. It is the distinctive that separates us from everybody else in the earth is the love that we've experienced and that we share. In the third century, there is a guy, he's a historian, a theologian, uh, uh, Tertullian, and he writes about how the Christian faith was expanding substantially throughout the Roman Empire, so much so that the Roman government became very concerned about this sect of Christians. So the Roman government sent spies into the local communities of faith to find out what is this all about because it was known that these Christians would not even take a pinch of incense and offer it to Caesar. One spy wrote, and Tertullian got it, and he shared it. And this is what the spy said. These Christians are very strange people. So I guess more things change, the more they stay the same. The spy says, these Christians are very strange people. They meet together in an empty room to worship. Yet they do not have an idol or an image. They speak of one by the name of Jesus who is absent, but whom they seem to be expecting to show up at any time. And my, how they love him and how they love one another. A Roman government spy gave a report that said this community of faith is built around the person of Jesus Christ whom they love, but not simply they love him. They love one another. And when Paul's saying, I am praying that your love abounds more and more, it's not simply about me loving God more, but it's about us loving one another in a great outflow of his mercy and grace. Now here's the problem with love in our culture. We don't really know how to define love. What does this love mean? Paul qualifies that. He doesn't just say, let love abound more and more. He said, no, there's got to be boundaries to this love. Just like a river has to have banks on either side in order to keep that river in the banks because without it being in the banks, it will destroy property and lives and homes. There are two banks, and what are those two banks? And we see them right here. He says that you would love more and more in knowledge and in all discernment. On one side of that river of love is the bank of knowledge. What is the knowledge he speaks of? It is the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That as we grow to know Jesus more, as we know his nature, his character, his personhood, as we know more about the person of God himself in Christ Jesus, we then have the basis by which love truly looks and functions and flows. He says, so I'm praying that your love does not grow based on cultural expectations or societal norms. I pray that your love grows more and more based on the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That we may know him and in that knowledge know how to love. Secondly, the other bank of that river is discernment. Discernment is a gift of the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit helps us discern what is truth based on not culture, not on political correctness, but on the word of God. Amen. Jesus was asked, what is truth? And he says, thy word is truth. 
So the way we love one another is through the knowledge of Jesus Christ discerned by the word of God in the context of Jesus Christ in the midst of his community. And he's saying, I want this love to grow more and more in your life. And I am praying for you that grace fellowship. I'm praying that over our lives this week and this past week and those watching online. I want you to know I am praying, oh God, let the people of grace fellowship, let them abound in the love of God that is based in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and in the truth of the word of God that is discerned by the spirit of God. I don't know about you. That's the community I want to be a part of. That's the people of God I want to be around that love in that capacity. Now watch that. That's the first word. Here's the second word. The second word is the word excellence. Notice, let's continue reading. Keep your Bibles open there. I know you brought them, so you might as well use them. The second great essential to our spiritual growth is not just love, but it's excellence. Notice verse 10. So that you may approve the things that are excellent. I want you to underline that little phrase, so that. This is a connecting phrase. This is causational. He says, I want your love to abound more and more so that in result of that, this is going to happen. So this is not a buffet line in which we decide a couple of these things we want in our life. You know, you'll go to the buffet, some of you today and say, well, I'll take the green beans, but I don't want the collards. You know, I'll take the mashed potatoes, but I don't want the carrots. That's not what this is. This builds upon one another and it begins in the foundation of love. And he says, once you allow this love to be the foundation that you're growing in and abounding in, you're doing that so that you may approve what is excellent. Now underline that word approve in your Bible or taking notes, do that, approve. That word simply means to test, to make sure it's authentic and pure. Uh, in the Greek culture then, uh, if you would take them coins or medals, they would test those. It's, a, it's an economic idea. Uh, it's not unlike today that if you go to the store and you give the cashier a $50 bill or $100 bill, uh, they're going to take out a marker and what are they doing? They're proving that it is not counterfeit, that it is truly valuable. It is what it says that it is. And here Paul says, I am praying that your love would abound so that you may test what's going on in your life and you'll choose those things, watch this, that are excellent. Not that are good, but those things in life that are truly excellent. Those things that you need to focus on those areas in life that you need to commit yourself to and your time and your talent and your resources. All of us consistently have a hundred different demands coming to our life. And so many times the things that are important or the things that are of excellence have to bow to the demands of the urgent. And therefore we put aside the excellent so that we can manage the demands of the urgent, and our life is lived in a chaotic means. And Paul's saying, I'm praying that you would learn the love of God through the scripture and the spirit so that you may be able to test the things that are coming into your life and say, that's not excellent, and I'm not giving my time, my attention, and my resources to that. You know, many of us live like we're a rubber bouncy ball, right? Watch this. I want you to see this illustration. It will help you, I think. Um, if I were to take a, like a super bounce ball and I were to throw it down, uh, it bounces back up because it is responding to an outward force pressing against it. It's somewhat laws of physics, right? So it bounces up and then it hits the ceiling. Now it's going to respond to that outward force. And if the ceiling hits the, the knee uh, portion of the ceiling, it's going to come this way and it's going to bounce that way. And it's going based on an outward force that's pressuring it, it responds from that. And I believe so many of us are living our life like a ricocheted ball. Bing, bing, bang, boom, here, there, everywhere. And we're responding because there's outward pressure coming from each direction. And we're just trying to keep up. And we're just trying to spin the plates of life. Just trying to make it through another week. Just trying to hold the family together. And I'm telling you, that's not God's very best for you. God says there are some things that you can say no to. There are some things you should say yes to. There are things that are good. But that's not what you're seeking. You are seeking that 
that which is excellent for your life, that which is of true value, and you are to test it and make sure so that our life is lived with purpose. Can I get a little amen from someone somewhere along the way today? Notice this. I want you to hear this passage. Let me get caught up in my notes. I'm in here somewhere. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. Paul writes and he says, be careful how you live your life. Listen to that. Listen, friends. Be careful how you live your life. Don't live as an unwise man, but live as a wise person. Making the most, watch this, making the most of your time. See, here's the reality. We all are given the same amount of time in a day. 24 hours. God gives us that blessing of a day. And he says, I want you to make the most of it. Many of us can't make the most of it because of the tyranny of all this other stuff that's always rising up and wanting to drive the narrative of our life. He says, you got you to gotta make sure that you're making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand, watch this, Understand what the will of the Lord is for your life. See, that is not a reactionary statement. That is a proactive statement by which now, because we are allowing the love of God to abound in our life, we are now able to think and say, you know what, this, that may be good, but that's not God. That may be demanding, but that's not where I want to put my life and my energy and my time. And Paul says, I want you to live your life with such excellence that you don't waste your life. That you don't feel as though you come to the end of your 20s or 30s or 40s and say, my gosh, what happened to that decade? But that you live your life to that which is excellent. We could say that that first prayer is a prayer for our heart. Help us to love. This is a prayer for our mind. Help us to discern. Help us to understand what is best. Many of us remember that great passage in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Don't be conformed. Don't be molded into this world's way of doing things. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Watch this. That you may be able to prove or test what is the good and the perfect and the acceptable will of God for your life. And Paul's saying, I'm praying for that. Not only will your love abound, but that you will now prove and approve that which is excellent. Then continue, if you will. Verse 10, part B. So that you may be sincere without offense until the day of Christ. Now watch this. We're building again. Let your love abound so that you will approve what's excellent, so that you will be sincere and not live an offensive life. What exactly are we getting here? He's talking about integrity. And he's saying a man that loves God, a woman that loves God and is growing in that love and is proving what is excellent, what they really should be a part of in their life is going to be a person that sees integrity developed in their personal life and in their inward life. And there's this word here, that word sincere. You may want to underline it or circle it. It's a remarkably fascinating word in the Greek language. Uh, There's a lot of debate as to where this word sincere comes from. Uh, Some believe it comes from the idea of wheat being sifted in a shifter, sifter. I better be careful with that. Um, Remember your grandma when she'd make biscuits or something? She would take her flour and she'd put it in a sifter and she'd sift. Uh, The idea is to get rid of any little trash that may be in there and it'd be pure. It'd be sincere. But there's a remarkable uh, insight on this word sincere here uh, that it comes from a, gr- uh, a Latin word right here, sinceria, where we get the word, the English word sincere. And this is what it means. Ready? It's, it's deep theology here. It means without wax. So if you read it in that context, Paul is saying, do these things so that you will be without wax. That may actually be one I can keep up with, Tony. I I don't know that I have a lot of... What does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean much to our culture, but it meant a lot to their culture. Uh, Because without wax, the sincera, the where it comes from is potters of that day were notorious that when they would make their pots or their plates or cups, when they would fire those finished pots, 
If there was an impurity in that pot, it would crack in the kiln. It would break off. Well, that unscrupulous producer of pots knew that he had resources wasted and he couldn't just throw away that pot. So he would take it out and he would get wax. He would melt it down, mix in some of the dust from the clay, and then he would use that as a binding agent on the plate or the pot so that the unsuspecting purchaser would come, buy it, take it home, and then by the time it was washed in hot water or sat out in the sun or hot food was placed on it, the wax would melt and the plate would break. And this was epidemic apparently at this time. So they began saying, our pots are sincere. Our pots are without the hypocrisy of wax that we're not covering up our broken places. And the way that people began to determine if the plate was pure and good is they would take it and they would hold it up to the sunlight because the beams of the light would shine through the wax and they could say, you're trying to get over on me and lie to me. What does this mean in our Christian faith? When Paul says, so that your life would be without wax, he's saying that we, not that we don't have cracks, not that we don't have places that are broken in our life, not that we haven't busted in the heat of the moment, but that we are not trying to cover them up with hypocrisy, trying to present ourselves as something that we are not. That we come before the Lord and we say, Lord, here are the places in my life that are hurting, that are broken, that are not lining up. And I don't want to take the wax of religiosity. I don't want to come up with some plan of myself. And I don't want to just pack it into these places. No, God, I don't want to cover it up. I need you to heal that. So, Lord, I'm bringing every broken place in my life. I'm bringing all the cracks in my life. And I'm laying them there. And I'm trusting you, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who is my healer, to fix the broken places. And I bear it before a holy living God. And Paul's saying, I'm praying you pray live your life without wax. Let me give you an illustration of what I'm trying to say. I hope this is making sense to us. Uh, If I were to go home this afternoon and make a loaf of bread, and if I were to gather all the ingredients necessary, the flour, the the baking soda, the water, the eggs, the, uh, the, the, all the grain and all that, and I were to measure it out precisely according to the recipe, and I threw it in the bowl, and then I threw it in the, the oven at 350 degrees for 30 minutes, it would not come out as a loaf of bread. It would come out as a mess. Because the ingredients alone do not make it a loaf of bread. It's when the ingredients are integrated with one another, each part touching the other part. And when my life is lived as single areas, compartmentalized, well, this is my church life and this is my work life and this is my home life and this is my life with my boys and this is my life at the club and this is my life. All of a sudden, what we're not going to do is live a life that is whole and pure and pleasing to God. We have to integrate all of ourselves into the grace and mercy of a God who brings us together in wholeness of Jesus Christ. That's why it's important that we bring our brokenness, our cracks, our messes to God and say, Lord, here it is if you can fix it God I place it in your hands and God says I can handle that I'm the creator and I am the recreator live your life without hypocrisy hallelujah be to God that's what he calls us to just turn to your neighbor and say get the wax out man get the wax out of your life here's here's the fourth one and let me hurry my time is up is fruit We start with love that abounds. We approve what is excellent. We live sincerely before God. And then fruit begins to abound. Verse number 11. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Christ Jesus. That as we pray for one another and as the Holy Spirit dynamically works in our journey together. 
then our life becomes fruitful, meaningful, productive. God does not want your life to be unproductive. Don't waste your life. But the fear is you hear that and you say, okay, I'm going to go out and I'm going to work harder, do better and all that. And then you come back next week or next month discouraged and defeated because you're not able to produce good fruit. You are not the one responsible for producing the good fruit. It is the Holy Spirit dwelling in you that produces the fruit. You just need to stay connected to the one who produces that. Uh, anybody here remembers Lawrence of Arabia? It was somewhat of a fictional character because of the movie, but there really was a guy that it was born out of. But in Lawrence of Arabia, uh, you might remember, he comes back to London and he brings a couple Bedouins with him, a couple Arabs that were Bedouins. They, they lived in the desert. That's all they ever knew in tents. And they come to London and these guys are absolutely just befounded by the beauty of the city. They get checked into their hotel room and what really touches them and what they're most amazed about when they go to the room is they have running water in the sink and in the tub. They're astonished because these are Bedouin nomadic people who've lived in the desert and the most precious resource for them is what? Water. And now they can walk up to this porcelain sink and turn on a dial and they get fresh, clean, cold water and they can turn on the other faucet and it brings out hot water. They said, oh, this is a game changer. We've got to take this back to our people. We've got to take this back to the desert. So guess what they did? They cut off the faucets. No joke. They cut them off and they hid them in their bags. Because they thought if they simply had the faucet, when they get back to the desert, they would turn them on and fresh water, cool water, warm water would flow. What they did not recognize is what too many believers don't recognize is that those faucets cannot produce water unless they are connected to the water source and we cannot produce the fruit of God's righteousness unless we are connected to the Lord Jesus Christ continually. And then when we are, all we have to do is open up the faucet of our life and his goodness and mercy and his righteousness will flow through us. The last prayer that Jesus prayed was found in John chapter 15 before his trip to the Calvary. And he said, Father, I pray that they would be one in me even as I am one in you. For I am the vine and you are the branch, they are the branches. And he prays that they, we would remain in him. And in remaining in him, watch this, we would produce much fruit that our life would not be wasted. Our life would not be left to chance. And that brings us to our fifth thing, and we close with this as Pastor Tracy comes. It's glory. And Paul closes that said, and he says, to the praise and the glory of Jesus Christ. To the praise and the glory of Jesus Christ. Friends, the Bible makes it extraordinarily clear that you and I were created by him and for him and for his glory were you and I created. You were created to bring glory to God. You were created to bring glory to your Father. And this is the context. In love, in excellence, in integrity, in fruit, and all that brings glory to your Father. And Paul, watch this as I close. He didn't say, guys, this is what I'm praying for me. He said, no, I'm praying this for you. And he didn't just say that so that we'd have an account of it. It became a model prayer that he wanted them to pray for him. And they become a part of this glorious community that's praying for and strengthening and building one another in the faith. Can I ask you to do this this week? And I'm just going to ask us to do our homework. Would you pray for one another in this context? Maybe your husband or wife, maybe your children, maybe your small group, certainly for your pastor. I need all this. And I'm going to pray this for you. And I have this deep conviction 
that the same God in which Paul prayed and God answered is the God that you and I pray to and he too shall answer us for the praise and the honor and the glory of Christ. And Paul said, I do this with all joy because of what God's gonna do.